All right, good morning, everyone. We're so happy to be here and to lead you guys this morning. Why don't you stand to your feet and we'll sing God's praise together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Thank you, worship team, and welcome to each and every one of you. We've been talking about standing for the Lord, doing all that you can, and after you've done all, to be able to stand. And what a, an appropriate song to begin our worship time this morning. It's a delight to have you here with us. Each and every one of you contributes to the other. You are those that encourage one another. The scripture tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. But all the more as we see the day drawing near. So we're glad that you folks can be online with us as well. And we trust that God will be a blessing to you. I was thinking of a particular hymn as I was preparing for worship uh, this day. And I came across the, the hymn from, uh, his name is Adrian, Adrianus Valerius. Now that's a common name, isn't it? <laughs> Adrianus Valerius. Well, he was back in the 1500s, and he wrote a hymn that we've sung before. Many of us have sung this. You'll recognize the words. He wrote, We gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. He chastens and hastens his will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us, joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we are winning. Thou, Lord, were at our side, all glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou will still be our defender let thy congregation escape tribulation. Thy name be praised, O Lord, make us free. Amen. What beautiful words that apply to us that we can serve and glorify this Savior of ours. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we love you. 
We thank you that you are. You are the one that we gather together to bless. We thank you that from the very beginning, because of your victory, we, this fight, are winning. And Lord, we ask today that you would minister to us. But Lord, we pray more importantly, you would minister through us. Lord, may we not be those that come and sit and soak and then forget and walk away. May this not be a time where we go through a, a routine but Lord, that we would hear with ears that hear. We would see with eyes that see. Oh, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Fall fresh on us, we pray this day. Be glorified, Lord. I pray that you would give each one of us who is ministering this day an anointing of your Spirit. Lord, that we would know that we've been in your presence. Lord, we pray for those that are sick among us. Lord, we lift them up. We we pray your hand of healing, Jehovah Rapha, would be upon them. Lord, we pray for our first responders, Lord, in these days that are so filled with turmoil. Lord, would you, would you give them strength and protection and wisdom and direction? We pray, Lord, for our president and his staff, those that are around him. Lord, would you give them divine wisdom and direction? Lord, we pray, we pray, oh God, that this, this country would repent that there would be revival across our land. So Lord, we commit this day to you and we give you praise for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I have a number of announcements, but first and foremost, I want to thank this group of young people that are here up on this platform ministering to us today. What a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. It's a a privilege and our honor to, to have you with us. There's a number of people that you want to recognize and meet after the service. There is Kieran Sheridan, who is on the drum. Now, I knew that that was the drum, okay? The rest of it is, you know, I, musically uh, disabled here. Uh, Christian Hahn, who is on the guitar. Is, where's Christian? Which is Christian? Yes, thank you. All right, see, I told you this is a... Brianna Sheridan, she is vocal. Where, Brianna, thank you. Good, we're having you. And Carolina Douglas, where's Carolina? Where's she? Carolina, thank you. Carolina? Caroline. Caroline. Caroline, great to have you with us. And then Rebecca Sheridan. Rebecca is on the keyboard. Thank you all of you. <laughs> all right. We're so delighted to have you with us. Thanks so much for coming. I have a, a, another few announcements that I just want to bring uh, to you. It's, uh, first of all, the evening service tonight. We're continuing studying the feasts of Israel. And I would encourage you to come. These are feasts, men and women, that we will be celebrating before our God on the new heaven and the new earth, if not before. These are not something that are ancient and they're for the past. These are for today, for us. And they instruct us in our most holy faith. So I would encourage you, we're just starting the study. We looked at the overview last week. We're going to be studying uh, the Passover this evening. And then 6.30 on Wednesday for our evening time of prayer. And then Friday, September 4, Friday evening, September 4, I got a, uh, a phone call from John Bob, one of the members of our congregation, and he's going to be heading up an evening time where we're going to be watching stream, live streaming uh, from Sight and Sound in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We're going to be live streaming the, uh, the story of Esther. So you'll want to be sure and uh, come to that. It's, I think it's going to be a very special time. And, and again, I'm so delighted that uh, John Bob is going to be uh, heading that up. And then finally, the last announcement that, that I have before uh, Brother Josh is going to come and read scripture for us. The last announcement that I have for you is that Stephen Hunter, who will be here on the last Sunday of August, August 30. He's going to be here the 28th, actually, Friday night, but then all day Saturday and Sunday, the, the 29th and 30th, he, he and his wife are coming. Steve is candidating to be possibly God's man as our next pastor. So please mark that down, Stephen Hunter, on August 30th, and please be praying for him and be praying for all of us that we would have God's will and that there would be unity uh, in the faith. So thank you for hearing all these uh, announcements. And Josh, would you come now and uh, draw us to the Word of God? 
Good morning. Good morning. That was a little weak. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Everybody's awake now. All right. Uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 5. So if you'd like to follow along, Ephesians chapter 5. Six. six. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the belt, breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you, have, you, can, with, with, with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may de declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the armor that you provide us, Lord God, against the enemy. Lord, we live in an incredibly dark age. Father God, help us to, when we put on our armor, as Pastor Chip has Speak, spoken about before not to take it off but Lord God realizing that one day when you call us home or you come you will have us take it off then but until then we're to stand firm on your word Father I pray for the churches in our nation uh, that are enduring persecution from people that don't want to see your word go forth don't want to see the gospel spread Lord God may they stand firm on your word on the truth of your word help us Lord God as we endeavor to reach the lost around us father we don't know when the lord jesus will come but we know that day is imminent lord so i pray that you help make us ready help us to make others ready Lord, i pray that you would be with those who are sick during this time lord god those who can't be with us out of fear for this virus lord god i pray that you give them your peace today Lord, i thank you for all who have gathered today here lord god we desire only to see you high and lifted up, Lord God. Not that any of us would be seen, but Lord, that you would be seen. Lord, you are the one true God, and we praise you. We worship you today, Lord God. We thank you for this day, Lord. Pray that you go before us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us this morning? And as you do, I just want to bring you this verse from Psalm 95, verse 1, and it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. The splendor of the King
Psalm chapter 28, verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
Dad, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for this time that we can just come here and worship you. I pray that as we dive into your word now, that you just, you just open our hearts and our minds to, to receive what you would have us receive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The children are dismissed at this time for Children's Church. Thank you for those of you who minister to our young ones. It is a blessing, a real service. Again, if you would turn to Ephesians 6. We've been looking at the armor these last number of weeks. And we will be looking at the shield of faith this morning in verse 16. Thank you, Josh, for reading that passage of scripture to us. And I... I've intentionally asked that we each week then read that, that same passage, 10 to 20, because it is so, that the context is so important. Jo, uh, the, the, the author, Paul, is, is wrapping up his, his word to this church in Ephesus, and he has been continuously telling them that you need to be able to stand. You need to be able to stand in the tough times. You need to be, stand, be able to stand in, in, the, in those areas of life where you're, you're threatened. You need to be able to stand when you're fearful. You need to be able to stand when things come into your life that are unexpected. It's, it's all about being able to stand, and all the more so, he says, after everything, stand. And therefore, he's been talking about these defensive weapons that God has given us. And we, we come this day to the shield of, of faith. I've mentioned to you on a number of occasions one of my favorite hymns. It's, there is a fountain. I love that hymn. I've told you before how it ministered to me in my own testimony. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And as I was walking my then eight-month-old baby in the dark, singing that song and decrying the fact that one of my brothers had just been arrested for bank robbery, and I was judging him, and as I was thinking about that and how dastardly that sin was, I came to the verse where Cowper sings, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And the Lord just stuck a sword right into my own heart and spoke to me. The author of that, that blessed hymn went through a very difficult time in his life before he came to know Christ. He tried to commit suicide, not once, not twice, four times. First time he took poison, that didn't work. So the next day he rented, this was back in the, the 1800s, he rented a horse and carriage and, and drove himself to the Thames River in England. He was English and, and, and he was going to, to dive into the river, but he said, I was strangely restrained. But he didn't want to give up on this thing, so the next day he decided he was going to fall on a knife. Well, the knife broke. <laughs> and so finally the fourth time he hanged himself. But people found him before he was dead and they revived him to his utter despair. <laughs> Can you imagine being in that kind of a state? And Cowper, Cowper like, Martin, like, like Martin Luther, came to a place where he was reading the scriptures in Romans and he realized that this, this God had a place for him and that he could live by faith in the Son of God. And so he went on to, to write a number of wonderful hymns, one of which it reads, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm, deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. That particular hymn became so famous, the first line, God moves in a mysterious way. Many people, including moi, for years thought that that was in the Bible. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm saying that we all of us, every Christian, struggles at times in our life. 
We all go through difficult times, times of pain, times of uncertainty, times where we're wondering, where are you, God? What are you doing? And Paul speaks to this very struggle here in this book, and particularly in this verse, verse 16. He says there is a promise from God, and it's summarized in this verse 16. In addition to all this, he says, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So the question I have to ask us today is what spear, what arrow is coming at you today? I remember... I remember years ago, and those of you who follow football from years past may remember the name Howie Long. He was the uh, defensive lineman, all-star defensive lineman for the uh, L.A. Raiders. I remember uh, Howie Long being interviewed by a commentator, and, and, and he was telling the com- radio commentator how he prepares every week, the physical drills and how they study the films, and I, I, I understood that. But then he said this to the, to the commentator. He, he said that... Every day, every Saturday before the game, at 4.30 in the afternoon, he gets a room in a motel, and for the next three hours, he looks at those game films so that he understands what's coming. He says, I do that because then I can go into that game with the confidence that I am the only one on the team that knows even before the ball is snapped what the play is going to be just by knowing the offensive formations. Dear friends, that's what Paul is talking to us here in Ephesians 6.16. He's saying, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We cannot always know the attacks, but we can be ready for those attacks. We can fend them off through this shield of faith. We're dealing here with one of the most basic functions of our Christian life, and that's faith. What is faith? What is this idea of of faith? Scripture says in Colossians 2, 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in Him. And we are to live in Him by faith, through the instrumentality of faith. What, What is this faith that we're talking about. Martin Luther, as I said earlier, came to understand what faith is. Reading in Romans 1.17, for the gospel, for the, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. Luther pulled away from that Catholicism and and the works theology and came into a place where he understood that he used to live by faith. What is this faith? We use that term. We we, we talk to others about faith, but what what is faith? For the non-believer, faith is something they find hard to understand. And for us as believers, it's a tough walk at times, isn't it? Living by faith. So I, I want to I wanna look with you. I want to look with you at this business of faith. And I want to look at it, first of all, by, by looking at the arrows of the evil one, and then the armor of the saint, and finally the action of faith. And if you have a bulletin, I would encourage you to pull that out and follow along. I want to look at the arrows of the evil one. Then I want to look at the armor of the saint. And then I want to look at the action of faith. Let's examine... First of all, this, this business of, of the arrows that the evil one thrusts at us. The word for arrow comes from the word to throw, balo in the Greek, balo. Originally, it meant a spear or a javelin that was being thrown, hurled at the opposition. The enemy in his, op, in his, in his incredible sophistication took the javelin, listen to this, They took the javelin, the tip of the javelin, they hollowed it out, they filled it with tar, and they would light it, and they would throw it at the enemy. Now, there's two characteristics in your bulletin that I want to draw out for you. First of all is the suddenness with which this arrow, this javelin, this fiery dart comes at you. You don't see it coming. 
Oftentimes the enemy hits you blindsided. It's a sudden thing. If, if you were in battle, if you were a Roman soldier and you were in battle, you wouldn't see that arrow coming perhaps until the last second and you would be able to, to move away from it. That's the first thing, the suddenness. But the second thing is it's pain. The pain of this arrow. It's a burning javelin. It's a fiery dart. Fire... Fire is something that is continuing, lingering, and pursuing in its pain. It seeks to destroy the entire object by slowly creeping over it. Isaiah, Isaiah 66 verse 24 writes about this. And they, he writes, the Christians, will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me, the Lord. Their worm will not die, and listen to this, nor will their fire be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. Jesus speaks about this same thing, this same lingering pain, when he talks in Mark 9, 47 and 48, he says, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That's hyperbole, right? When you're, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown, catch that word, thrown into hell where their worm does not die. And then listen to this, and the fire is not quenched. Christ talks about the pain of fire. Satan, Satan attacks His arrows are meant to linger, to burn, to keep on causing you and me pain. And as we contemplate this ultimate, ultimate attack by the enemy, in other words, to keep you and me out of heaven, to keep keep a non-believer as a non-believer, we see this plight of the unsaved. I come back to this picture of Jesus talking about the fact they will be thrown into hell. Can you imagine? You who, if you're not a believer, if you're, if you're not in, in the Lord, if you have relatives that aren't in the Lord, if you have friends, if you're online and you're watching and you're not in Christ, there is a day coming where Christ says, you will be thrown into hell. There will be someone bigger, better, stronger than you who will throw you into this place that Jesus talks about there. The fire will not be quenched. I would pray that something like that would motivate us. I pray that it would, it would, it would bring us to tears. I pray that it would motivate us to, to reach into the lives of those who yet don't know Christ. And so I, I want to look at these flaming darts, these flaming arrows that the enemy throws at us. I'd like for you to think with me for a few minutes about Satan being the proprietor of an arrow manufacturing business. All right? Satan is, you know, he's, he's the proprietor of, a, of an arrow manufacturing business. And, and I think there's a number of names that you could put to it. You, you know the word Sheol, it's the word for hell. Well, I think about Sheol's shaft shop. Hmm? How about that? Sheol's shaft shop. I mean, that could be the banner. Over, over his shop. Or how about this? Hell's homemade hurt locker. Huh? <laughs> all right, all right. Now maybe you won't like that one. How about Hades' hottest horror sticks? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like this one. I like this one. Gehenna's gougers. Huh? <laughs> Whatever you call it, they are arrows, fiery arrows thrown at you and me all the time. And I want us to see what they are. And I want us to understand that that whatever we're looking at, the enemy wants to attack us and the Lord gives us the shield of faith. We've got to remember, again, as I said at the outset, Ephesians 6 is a summary of all that Paul has been talking about to this Ephesians church and to you and me. He's wrapping up, he's summarizing all this great truth that he wants these believers to know and understand. That's why he speaks in terms of the armor, in terms of defense, in terms of standing strong against the onslaught of the enemy. Men and women, we're to take these truths and apply them to our lives. Oh, I pray as I prayed this morning, I pray that we wouldn't just simply hear the word, 
but that we would allow it to, to apply and, and drive home the truths that God has for us. I want you to look with me at this first arrow from Satan's shaft shop. I would call it the arrow of deception. Oh, folks, this is the Cadillac. This is, this is number one. This is the best arrow that, that Satan can throw. And it's thrown at the unbeliever. And, and the essence of this, this deception is that you don't need Jesus. You're good enough. You can work your way. Oh, you go to church every now and then. You give to this charity. You're living a good life. You're better than that person. That's the arrow of deception that the enemy, enemy tries tries to throw at us. Listen to Paul's words. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He's talking against this arrow of deception. You can't get there on your own. Your works will never get you into heaven. Paul goes on in chapter 2. He talks talks about these people as objects of wrath, uncircumcised, verse 11, separate from Christ, verse 12, excluded from citizenship, foreigners of the covenant, without hope, without God. Do you see? Do you see the flow of inspired thought here? Chapter 1, he's talking about the grace of God. Chapter 2, he's talking about the vileness of mankind. Paul spends an entire chapter trying to show us that man is bankrupt in and of himself. He doesn't even have enough money to phone an attorney to get him out of jail. And dear friend, if you're, if you're here this morning or if you're online watching and you're thinking you're good enough to get to heaven, I say to you by, the virtue, by virtue of the authority of the word of God, it is only by faith, only by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, a passage of scripture that is very familiar to many, if not most of us here. He says, for by, faith, by grace are you saved through by the instrumentality of faith. So again, I come back to this question, what's faith? We use that term again and again and again. What is faith? Faith, folks, here it is. Faith in a word is reliance. It's reliance. As I was putting the message together, I thought of the fact that our brother Josh and his wife Trudy and their son Joshua went to Niagara Falls a few weeks ago on vacation. They were visiting some former members of our church up in New York and they had opportunity to go to Niagara Falls. They came back and they were sharing all about how beautiful it was, showed us pictures of it. And as I thought of that trip that you folks took, I thought of a very common illustration that perhaps some of you have heard before. There's a man, a, t- a tightrope uh, acrobat, tightrope artist, and he's going back and forth across the Niagara Falls on a, on a rope with a wheelbarrow. And he goes over and then he comes back and he's doing all these different gyrations and he's telling people, do you believe that I can go across the Niagara Falls? Well, yeah, yes, we do, we believe. And then he says, now, who's going to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> That's reliance. That's faith. Let me give you another picture of faith. It comes to us from the legal side of things. It's called detrimental reliance. I remember when I was in law school having to learn about this. Detrimental reliance. It's a term in scripture, a a term in the the legal community, and it, it is a truth that you have to live by. If you are in your car and your brakes fail and you hit a tree, and then you go to court and you're going to sue the maker of the... My friends call my car a Toyota, I, you know. But you have a good t- Toyota, and you crinkle it in a tree, and the brake, because the brakes gave out, and you're going to sue Toyota because of your injuries, and the defense from Toyota comes in and says, all right, take this man to the hospital and have him examined by a doctor, and the doctor examines you, and there isn't a thing wrong with you. You can't go in there and sue them for physical injury. Why? Because you did not rely on Toyota to your detriment. Now, flip that idea of reliance 
And we're saying we put all our reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, dear friend, that's what faith is. But I've got to move on from this, this arrow that, that, that the enemy tries to push us away into our works. We come to this arrow of disinheritance. Oh, the enemy, the enemy in, uh, tr- t- continuously tries to, to, to push us away, to, to show us or to, to, to convince us that, that, we, that we don't have an inheritance. And yet the entire chapter 1 of Ephesians talks about this position that we have as Christians. God tells us that we who are born again have been chosen. We're predestined. We're adopted as sons. We've been redeemed. We've been bought back. We've had revealed to us the mystery of the purpose of the world that all things should and will one day be brought under the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us that we have been made heirs of the kingdom and finally that we have been given a seal, a down payment in the Holy Spirit assuring us that we are in this inheritance. But Satan would have you disbelieve that. He would have you Think well. I'm. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not chosen. I'm. I'm not really going to go. I'm. I, I'm not. I'm. And so he attacks you with that. And then he also attacks you with the third arrow, the arrow of exclusivity. He's basically here trying to attack the assurance of faith. He's trying to tell you, well, yeah, you made this profession of faith, but look at you. Look at the sin in your life. Look how you've failed God. Look how, look how you've, you've not lived up to. And he tries to convince you that you're not really saved. I remember the day. I remember the day. John 5, 24, when a brother showed me that scripture. And I read that scripture and I finally understood. I am in the body of Christ. The enemy tries to attack us. And yet again, Paul, in these first three chapters, is speaking to this very issue. He talks about us being in Christ. Men and women, in these first three three chapters, he says it no less than 22 times. You and I are in Christ. We are absolutely assured. Another arrow. The arrow of ineptness. Oh, my goodness. Self-worth. We come back again and again and again to this whole issue of self-worth. That's where the enemy tries to tear us down. He tries to tell you you're worthless. After all, he is the accuser, isn't he? The accuser of their brethren. And he will tell you again and again at the slightest thing you do wrong. Well, look at you. The arrow of ineptness. And then... You know, yeah, before I leave that, I I, want to make this point. The Lord will rebuke you. The Lord will correct you. But he will never attack your self-worth. And if you sense that your self-worth is being attacked, you need to understand immediately that's from the enemy. And you need to plead the blood of Christ. You need to say out loud, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus I am a blood-bought child of the living God, and I am His. My worth comes from Him. Finally, there's this arrow of indifference. And that's really this whole issue that chapters 5 and 6 of Ephesians speak to. The relationships that we are to have with one another. The relationships that we're to have with our college students and our high school students, with our friends and our neighbors, our husbands and wives, our parents and our children, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be what Philippians 2 talks about as a love offering. We're to be pouring out our lives for one another. And the enemy constantly tries to get us to live in our own universe. We've just come through a series on Sunday evening with Paul Tripp. Reverend Paul Tripp has been talking about this whole idea that you are not, you are not to be living as the center of your universe. And yet we do that so, so very often. 
So we see Satan has taken these six chapters of Ephesians and he's twisted them around. He takes chapter 1 and tries to convince us that we don't have an inheritance. He takes chapter 2 and he tries to deceive us that that we're not really in Christ. Chapters 1 through 3, he talks about the fact that, that... tries to convince us we're excluded from the family. Chapter 4, he tries to convince us that we are inept. In chapters 5 and 6, he tries to get us to center our lives on ourselves and not others. And folks, at some time or other in our lives, we feel like Cowper, William Cowper. We just want to just throw in the towel. That's why we need the armor. And so I want to look with you secondly at the armor of the saint the shield of faith. The original word, the original word here for shield comes from a word thurion. I've written it out in your outline, thurion. And this is so rich. Please listen. Please hear this. Thurion means door. Isn't that rich? I mean, when you and I think of a shield, we typically think of, you know, one of those little plastic toys that you buy in the store that's no bigger than a dinner plate. That's not the shield that Paul is talking about here. It's a Roman shield. It was four feet high, and it was two and a half feet wide. It was covered first with linen, then it was covered with a hide. It was bolted on the top and bottom by iron. And it was designed so that it could take a flaming spear and extinguish it. Can you hear it going? Can you hear the enemy striking at you and you put up that? That's what Paul is talking about when he talks about this. But there's even more. There's even more to this. Oh, I love this. I got so excited when I started to study this. This word, thurion, door, doesn't mean just this door. It means a rock, a big rock over the mouth of a cave. Now, can you, can you figure any other place you would like to be when you're in the middle of a fight than in the center of a cave with a big rock over the front of that cave? That's the word. That's what God gives you and me when we are fighting the enemy. That's what this shield is. Let me say this to you. Faith is that same complete from top to bottom in the middle of a cave hidden behind a heavy stone door protection against the devil. Let me read that to you again. Faith is that same complete from top to bottom, in the middle of a cave, hidden behind a heavy stone door. Protection. When you're fighting against the evil one. Listen to some of the shields that God gives us. Genesis 15, verse 1. God says to Abram, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. (laughs) Your very great reward. God himself, Christ, is our shield. He is our rock. He is the door behind which we march. Jesus is our shield, our door, our rock. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Psalm 84, 11. The Lord is the sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Do you... Catch what we're saying here. Nothing can harm us. Does that mean pain won't come into our life? Surprises? No, no. But God will be our shield. He will be our protector. So I have to ask, what spear is being thrown at you this morning? What fear? What dreaded decision? What disruption? What, what, what disappointment? What we need is to put on the shield, to take up the shield of faith. And that brings me to the action of faith. Paul says, take up the shield. And he means literally to take hold under one's control by one's own initiative. What what are we saying here? If you are in battle and your shield is over here and you're standing here like this, what good is your shield? You have to take it up. You have to 
embrace it. You have to take hold of it. And the word literally means that we are to take control of something that we have been given the legal right to have. The Lord says it's rightfully yours. You and I have a right to take up this shield. It's there for the taking. It's our right. It's something we are to take captive. It's something that we are to collect upon, like a bill collector would collect a bill. He expects us, the Lord expects us to take hold of it and to do otherwise is to sin. So first of all, we take under one's control. That's what we're to do. Secondly, we are to claim as an absolute legal right. And when we do, what happens? What does the scripture say? When we do that, we extinguish, we extinguish the fiery darts, the fiery arrows. Oh, this is rich. Again, folks, please hear this. This word extinguish means to still, to dampen down. But it means even more than that. It literally means to suck dry. Suck dry. When you and I put up the faith, the reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, you take this battle. The battle is yours. It's not mine. When you and I do that, it literally sucks dry. The accusations of the enemy, the attack of the enemy. That's why we have this precious, precious armor. Dear friends, as we wend our way through this life, Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. But we have his shield. And we can mount that shield. And we can do so to the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths. I pray that it would be immediately a practical use. Lord, we know the enemy hates your word. He hates you. He hates us. And he will stop at nothing to attack us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that by your power, you will enable us to take up this shield of faith with which we will suck dry these overtures, these insinuations, these lies of the accuser, the deceiver. And so, Lord, we give you praise and thanks, for we ask these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you receive this word from our Lord as a benediction, as a blessing upon you as we dismiss? It comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.